Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Wendy Elmo and I'd like to welcome you back if you've been part of this training series already. Um, if not, welcome. You don't need to have listened to or seen the last two in order to be able to benefit from this one. They can all stand alone. And if you'd like to go back and take a look at the one in January that was on cognition and developing accommodations and strategies, that is up on our website on the training page where you registered. And um, Jen will likely put that into the chat for you. And you can also find this PowerPoint for today. That's already up there. And then following this, the video, the, uh, the recording will be up there as well. So it, today we're going to be talking about behavioral and psychosocial changes following brain injury and then give you some things that you can do about it. But first, let me talk to you about who we are. We are brain links. Uh, we are supported at the federal level by the ACL and at the state level by the Tennessee Department of Health's Traumatic Brain Injury Program. And we're a program of the Tennessee Disability Coalition. And what we do is provide information and training to folks like you. So we do a lot of this kind of thing where we give mostly professionals, what they need to better serve people who have traumatic brain injury, regardless of the setting that they're in. And uh, we go around and we, we talk um, to a wide variety of, of settings and help people to uh, fit things into their particular setting. We have lots and lots of materials on our website. Please go and check those out. And we also have uh, four toolkits. Two of them would be really relevant here. I think the one for survivors, families and caregivers, and then the one for service professionals. You can take a look at those at tndisability.org slash brain. And then we also have a lot of trainings up on our YouTube training channel. And I would say go in by playlist. That's probably the easiest. Try to find where you fit and go in that way. So we're going to talk about psychosocial issues, uh, behavior, what are they, behavioral issues, behavioral de-escalation, and then there should be time to talk a little bit about trauma-related behavior as well, and then give you some tools. And I'll, I'll be giving you also some tools throughout. So we come from a brain traumatic brain injury background and acquired brain injury background, but the information that I'm going to be talking about is really going to apply to anyone who has uh, brain changes, so they could be developmental as well. Um, it applies a, a little bit less to dementia, a little bit less to autism. However, if you work in those areas, you should still have something here today that you can walk away with. And I'm going to talk from a cognitive communication perspective. I would not consider myself a behavior expert, but I would consider myself a cognition and communication expert. I'm board certified in neurologic communication disorders, and um, I'm a speech language pathologist. And my background is that, that um, for the majority of my career, I worked in a brain trauma unit for outpatient. So what are psychosocial issues? So they're they're kind of this big grouping of things. It's It's how we relate in social situations, and it also brings in the psychological status uh, of ourselves at that point. And it involves social cues in the environment. We're gonna talk about these in a sec and, and our social interactions. What's our impulse control like? What's our mood and our behavior like? So if you're having issues with psychosocial, uh, in the psychosocial domain, you may be having difficulty interpreting social cues. And I would say a really good way to kind of orient yourself as we're going through this whole thing is be thinking about people that you work with or that you you caretake for as I'm going through it and kind of be saying, okay, that, that might be an issue or that's definitely an issue. So you have something to kind of anchor it to. So uh, folks with psychosocial issues might have difficulty interpreting social cues and also giving off the, the right cues, letting people know what it is that they're really thinking or feeling at that time. They may have difficulty in overly stimulating environments, so they have a low frustration tolerance or, or it, it overloads their cognition. 
you might see mood swings and you might see emotional liability. So it's not liability, it's mo emotional liability, which is your, your labile, you are, um, your emotions just are there to an extreme. So you may begin laughing when it really wasn't exactly um, a laughing out loud situation, or you might start crying when it, yeah, it was sad, but it, it wasn't over the top. It, it, it shouldn't kind of take you to that point, but that will happen in folks who have emotional liability. Um, our self-esteem plays into it, uh, how we might be overly confident. We really shouldn't be in this situation. Um, and we might also be under underconfident and not interact enough in the situation. We may have a lack of awareness of our deficits and that can play out in it socially in a lot of different ways where we just keep on talking and talking and talking and not realizing that it's not our turn to talk anymore, that there, that there are rules in society, kind of unwritten rules, a lot of them about how we are in a conversation. Um, our emotional adjustment, let's say that this was a traumatic brain injury, our adjustment to that injury will come into play too. Are we anxious now or depressed? That's gonna change things. Is there a lot of anger? Are we withdrawn? Are we egocentric? Everything is about me or um, dependent on others to kind of communicate for us. Uh, we might see that the behavior is not appropriate, age appropriate. It's they're just acting too young. And we, we are um, really good at judging these things. We as just regular folk out in our lives and in the community, we're really good, even though a lot of times we're not taught these rules. Sometimes we are, we're like, you know, don't, your mom's like, don't stand that close, um, shake his hand. You know, we do get some of those rules for sure. And a lot of them we just kind of pick up. Um, but we know right away and kids especially know right away when say behavior is not age appropriate. Um, so just kind of keep those things in mind that we're, we're kind of judging that all the time. We might see impaired self-control where it's they're verbally um, impulsive or aggressive, physically aggressive. We might see impulsivity play out. Uh, you might see someone who's just restless. They can't stop moving. They have maybe limited motivation. Maybe they have no initiation. We talked about that in cognition last month where initiation is that internal drive to get you to do something. And, and in this case, it might be communication or interacting socially. And then I'm gonna read this as it is, but then I'm gonna give you the interpretation of it. So we might also see intensification of pre-existing maladaptive behaviors or disabilities. And what that just means is that something they already did or had is now worse. And I think this is really important to talk about because we'll hear all the time about uh, yeah, they have an attention problem, but they always did. They were ADD before this. Well, that doesn't mean that it's not something that shouldn't be addressed. Unfortunately, injuries tend to take something, kind of takes our what we weren't good at before, right? Because that's kind of like a place where we're weaker in our brain and makes that part worse. So we tend to see those things. So we can't just write them off and go, ah, they were always that way. That's why it's really important if you're working with someone to really understand them and really understand, well, how often do they have verbal outbursts? Well, how often um, do they um, do they cuss at someone and walk away? That's the, kind of the same thing. But it, you know, we need to understand their behavior so that we know when there's a change in it, that something's going on. Uh, we also will tend to see inappropriate sexual behavior or disinhibition. And we need to understand what the person is attempting to convey. So let's say we have, and we would see this a lot with like, let's say adolescent um, boys, especially where maybe they were patting her on the bottom, but when you, and we're like, hey, you can't do that. You know, sexual assault is terrible. Um, when you talk to them, they might have been saying, I just want her to let her know that I liked her. And so it's not so much they're attempting to be inappropriate by any means. They're just attempting to convey something, but they don't know the right way to do it. So we need to teach them first, figure out what is it that they're trying to say, teach them how to convey it in an appropriate way. And then um, it's going to require typically repeated role, role play of that situation 
just as it does with other situations where you can't just, you know, I told you, you can't do that because we're horrified sometimes at, at what we've seen or heard. And um, it, it's not enough to just say, you can't do that, do this instead. We've got to give um, that opportunity for that new behavior to be learned. Hypersexuality is another thing that we see. And this is a little bit different in that it's this increased need or this intense pressure for sexual gratification. And one thing that you need to think about is uh, bipolar disorder. So getting them a referral to someone to, to think about bipolar, it is a, a primary symptom of bipolar disorder and it occurs in 57% of people with bipolar. And it's associated with both um, hypomania and mania. And it's it's not separate. The hypo, hyper um, sexuality is not separate from the bipolar that it needs to be treated as its own symptom. It needs to be tr treated as part of the bipolar so that um, when you treat the bipolar, the symptom of hypersexuality will go away. And so the Barbara Schneider Foundation has some good information on that. I don't wanna dig deep into this, but I wanted you to have this here in the PowerPoint. And right now the PowerPoint is already up on our training page. And um, this video will be there shortly thereafter. And, uh, but I just want to, I'll go through a, a few of these things with you. So again, recognizing that the hypersexuality that you see is, um, it's a symptom of that disorder. We don't want to be judgmental of what we see, you know, that they're dressing inappropriately of their language or of their actions, because it's really a symptom of this bipolar. We don't take it personally. And we understand that, that something is really escalated for this person in this moment so we need to get them help uh, we need to actively listen to them uh, separating the person from the behavior that we see which is also always a great thing to be able to do there's a person here there's a behavior here um, we want to be uh, careful about not letting the person steer things back to the sexual topics uh, clarify this is I, I think of these next few things as more of like if you were a police officer coming upon this situation where you don't know the person most of us will know the person that we're working with but understanding you know if you've been drinking try to get a, a feel for what's happening in this situation have you been diagnosed with a mental illness and is there somebody that I can contact and then help them to get to a uh, to someone who can help um, and be very careful of what you say uh, because it can be very uh, misinterpreted. So um, can I help you I get you, you get what you need. Be very careful with, with things like that. Um, you can stop in anytime you want. No, you can't. There are boundaries here. So set clear boundaries, give clear directions. Um, and like I said, we know the rules and it's very weird to have to tell somebody the rules, but you may have to. You are too close to me right now. You have to stand back there. Um, you can pace, but pace over there. Uh, or And maybe having to say, I, I, we need to get you to a hospital because I'm really concerned about you right now. Um, so for a lot of um, behavior in general, behavior issues, the frontal lobe is a big part of that because the frontal lobe is the breaking mechanism, it's the um, it's the teacher, it's the, the supervisor, the mom, it's called a lot of these things. It's the boss of, of every other part of the brain because this part of the brain has control over what the other parts of the brain do. There's a lot of connections between the other parts of the brain and the frontal lobe. So even if there wasn't a frontal lobe injury per se, you can still see issues with it because of the way the communication between areas is not happening as as well so this is that breaking mechanism it's the self-control the judgment the self-monitoring the stopping of behavior that can often be impaired so a really great overall psychosocial strategy is to um, I'll, I'll talk with people and say you know before you before this injury you used to just do things and they're nodding yes 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 you used to just act you should just go but now I need you to think of everything as having three steps. Before you act, there's a planning time. And we think about, well, what's gonna happen? What am, what am I likely to have problems with? What am I really good at with this? 
and then after you then act, apply that all to the action, then evaluate. So as soon as you can, after that thing, whether it was a party or a, a work meeting, whatever it was, evaluate, how did I do? And here's where we might jump in and support that and in, in helping them to understand how did you do? Think about well, what, what did you try? What did you not try? What might you try better next time? And then that evaluation kind of becomes the planning stage for the next time that you're gonna act. Uh, so really breaking things down, slowing things down and getting some strategies and evaluation in there. So, uh, some other general psychosocial strategies, again, like I said, practice those new behaviors. Don't assume they're just gonna happen because you said so. Help them to interpret the social cue. So what do you think that he was saying yeah, by his, his cues? When he was trying to turn and walk away, uh, what do you think he was he was trying to tell you? And you kept on talking. Um, plan ahead speaking topics. I used to do this a lot with folks uh, to plan. There was a party. There was something coming up that they were concerned about. They can't couldn't always think quickly on their feet. So we would plan ahead topics. Or if you had someone who tends to talk about inappropriate things, plan some appropriate things. So they've got sometimes the when you jump to let's say that um, the inappropriate inappropriate conversations, inappropriate sexual, taking things down a sexual track is sometimes just nervousness that I didn't know what else to say. So help plan ahead speaking topics. Um, I remember somebody, we would write them out on a an index card and she would occasionally go into the bathroom and she would just kind of double check and check things off. And obviously you have to be able to maneuver in the moment as well, but she always had something that she could she could bring up. Um, help them to understand what their behavior is conveying. What do you think it they think right now when or, or before when you were standing so closely to them or when you had your arms crossed? Don't assume they understand that. Um, help them to control the environment, which is reducing distractions. We talked about in January, verbal distractions, visual distractions help folks to maximize their health. So their food, their exercise, their sleep. A lot of the deficits, especially a frontal lobe, will make them make impulsive choices. So they're often kind of um, taking a brain that's been compromised for some reason and then compromising it further for years by not giving it what it needs in terms of the food, the exercise and the sleep. So educating folks about that um, increasing awareness of their deficits so that they they know going into a situation what they might have trouble with and then increasing their conscious awareness of their strategies. So um, they may do something from time to time that's helpful, uh, but helping them to be more consciously aware of what's effective for them. You did this and it was really helpful for you. Um, help them with their emotional adjustment if they're having a reaction to um, to their change in in life with new deficits, with new physical challenges, help them by getting them to someone like a counselor, a psychologist. Um, we need to practice self-control and model self-control strategies. This is huge. So if someone begins to kind of get angry or escalate and we start to go with them, you need to be quiet. We don't talk like that in here or, or something like that where we're not modeling it. Um, it's not going to be helpful. So we need to stay calm in, in all situations and model the behavior that we want to have. Um, and someone may need moods for uh, meds for mood stability. So a referral there might be helpful. So we're gonna now kind of switch this, all of that, yes, it is behavior. We're gonna switch now into uh, more of a focus on traumatic brain injury influence behavior. And if you're, you work with people who have autism, then I would refer you also to specific autism resources. And these are some for Tennessee, and those will be in the, the PowerPoint that's on the, our website. Um, so a really helpful thing to remember is that it is the brain causing the behavior. 
So there's a lot of turnover in our fields. And I really feel like some of it is uh, we get drawn into things on a kind of personal level. Um, and sometimes we don't have enough education, which is what this is all about, is helping people to understand. Because if you go in armed, then you kind of feel like you know what to do and, and it's okay. So it's the brain causing the behavior. So we can separate things out that way. And if we can change the behavior, so you're, you're constantly shaping that behavior, you begin to change the brain. And if we can change the brain, say like through something like a medication, we can change the behavior. So these are, you can go both ways at it. And sometimes one route is more appropriate than the other. So also to help us kind of stay in situations and feel better armed, the behavior is often the symptom. It's just the symptom of what's going on underneath the surface. And from, from our perspective, what's going on underneath the, the perspective with someone, the surface with someone with a brain injury is they're having a problem or they're challenged with their cognition and or, and, or their communication. And that's what's creating the problem with the behavior. So if we understand this, we can then help the person. We're not gonna punish the person for the behavior if they're having a cognitive issue. We're not solving anything and the behavior will just come up again when the, when the cognition is a challenge. So we can not punish them and we can help them to better understand what's happening so that they can better control their behavior. And so I, it sounds like it's all um, rainbows and butterflies that we support the, the communication and the cognition and you can change the behavior. Sometimes it is as simple as that. So we see a lot of behavior challenges after traumatic brain injury and acquired brain injuries, up to 50% are at risk for behavioral problems or disorders. And those are likely to work worsen over time. And that's because even if you think about uh, typically developing children, if they're doing something that is not um, socially appropriate or it's it's a they re react to everything with a tantrum, it's not going to get better because we're reinforcing it when we're allowing it. So we need to do something to get in the middle of that to help them. And then otherwise it is likely to worsen over time that that's going to be their go-to. Uh, the family and the living environment contributes a lot. And we're going to talk about this relationship between behavior and the people around them in a little bit. So we need a positive environment around them and then positive parenting styles or positive teaching styles, uh, positive therapeutic styles. We see lots of different behavior changes following a traumatic brain injury. You might see physical and verbal outbursts, poor judgment, disinhibition, impulsive behavior. They're just acting really quickly talking very quickly, saying something that really if they thought about it a second, they might not have said, you might see just this leaning into negativity and that's their go-to, um, not sometimes not really realizing that that's what they're doing. Uh, intolerance for lots of different things, uh, the environment for certain behaviors or ways of talking. You might see an apathy, just not really interested in anything might see that egocentricity I mentioned, rigidity and inflexibility. Um, and we talked about this under cognition in terms of, uh, um, uh, can't think of the word, uh, being perseverative. I'm stuck on perseverance. Um, being perseverative. Perseverative is like a, an, a, a big stuckness. You're really stuck on something um, or always go back to that. So uh, uh, we do see it in TBI, a, a way that some of you might be familiar with is that people who have autism might be um, very focused on, um, on trains or on dinosaurs and that's their go-to. That's what they always wanna come back to. That's kind of a, a rigidity and an inflexibility and recognizing that it's the brain doing that. We see lots of risky behavior after TBI, a lack of empathy, just not able to take the other person's perspective and understand their emotions in a situation, that lack, lack of motivation and initiative we talked about, depression and anxiety. So it, all of these things listed here impact 
our cognition and behavior. If you've never had an injury before, if I'm too tired, I'm more likely to get angry with someone, especially if I feel like they're pushing me. Uh, so all of these things will have, will, will work on us to change our behavior and our cognition. Think of it as a person who has a TBI now has that threshold lower. So mine might be really high. I might have to be really exhausted before you can then push me over that limit to get me to react in some way that I normally wouldn't. With a person with a brain injury, think about that threshold as being much lower. So now if I'm tired, I can cross that threshold much more easily. So if I'm emotional, even if I am happy, it will make me, you, you see kids who are happy, they're just running all over and they're so excited and they can't control themselves. It happens on that end of the emotional spectrum too. If we're stressed, tired, we're in pain, it's really hard, we'll snap at people, we're sick or under the influence of drugs or alcohol, whether those drugs are prescription or not. Sometimes they can lower a threshold. So just keep those things in mind. And I think of the, the Snickers commercial that you're not you when you're, ang when you're hungry, uh, you're not you when you're in pain, when you're sick, when you're under the influence. And of course, hungry can do it too. I have seen that in my own family where I have family members who in the morning, if they do not eat, um, there will be trouble. And luckily we're all, we've all figured it out now. And we can say, do you think maybe you should have some breakfast? And they'll say yes. And, and then a life instantly changes. It's amazing. Um, so we always look at the communication and the cognitive demands of the situation. What is happening here? What is required? What is that person's communication strengths and weaknesses? And we can get this by observation, but we can also get it through a speech language evaluation. Um, I always say rely on your team. So if you work with other, I'm a, I'm a speech language pathologist. If I work with an OTPT uh, behavior specialist, uh, let's all pool what we're seeing because it, you're always going to get a different uh, perspective from somebody else and somebody may have the, the answer when you don't. Understand their cognitive strengths and their weaknesses. What is being stressed right now in this situation? We can get a neuropsychological eval for that. And I'm going to talk about the brainstorming solutions tool, which is another way of gathering information. And we help need to help identify triggers so that we know what they are and we can maybe head them off, but then also so that we can help the person identify the triggers that, listen, we're going into this type of a situation and sometimes that's a challenge for you. So we need to be ready. What are we gonna do? Um, always remember that behavior is communication. So instead of looking at the behavior and getting, um, getting angry at it, getting offended by it, remember that it is communication. What are they trying to communicate? And very often they don't know. They've been pushed over their threshold and they just don't know what it is. Um, but they might be trying to communicate that they're confused, that they're frustrated, they're angry, they're in pain. They may feel stupid. Things are moving so fast. You all are talking, you all are getting it. I am not, and I just feel stupid right now. So we really have to dig to figure out what it is. And we often can't do that when they are caught up in the behavior, when they've already become angry in that situation. We need to wait until afterwards, not too long afterwards, because we need to still have it fresh. But um, especially if we can get them to understand behaviors, communication, say, hey, what were you, what were you trying to say there, do you think? And we can help out by... Uh, offering some things that we see. If they can say it, then, then we go with that first. Otherwise, then we might assist in, you know, throwing out some suggestions. And then if we can, um, we can give them the words so that they can use the words to say what it is that they're feeling or what they want or what they need, even if it's just, um, I need a minute and have the opportunity to walk away or to for have everybody just be quiet for a minute. Um, it could be that I'm getting frustrated. Would you mind slowing down? So the, the better that we can pinpoint what it is that is happening for the person and what they need, the better we can put words and help other people around them to help them as well. So the brainstorming solutions tool. I mentioned this under uh, last month under cognition because 
this really takes the whole person and it looks at what is happening in a situation, what is the person's current challenge, and pulling in all of the resources that we have to figure out what's going on. So last time I talked about it from the, the cognitive standpoint, it goes through all of the different cognitive areas and we need to have an understanding of what those things are. And if you say, well, you know, I don't understand cognition really well, go back to last month's training and take a look at that. I don't expect you to be a cognitive therapist. That really does take a lot of training, but you can begin to kind of think about things through this lens when you're interacting with somebody. And, uh, and then you also have better kind of questions to ask when you do talk with the speech therapist or the neuropsychologist or the behavior specialist or somebody else on your team, do you think it could be this? And then you all are kind of looking to see if it's that, or maybe it's this. Um, so any evaluations that have been done and then using this, um, this tool, you don't have to fill it all out. We're not looking to try to give you extra work. This is just kind of a template that would be in the mind of someone who is a cognitive therapist and is coming into. So when I would come into an evaluation situation, I would be, all of these things would be in my head. They'd be on my papers as well, but they're, they get into your head where you're like, okay, there's a, it's that, it's that, it's that. Here's what we need to do. Here's what we need to try. Here's what we need to talk about. So it goes through all of these different cognitive areas, also brings in all the perceptual areas, vision, hearing, because if you can't hear the situation, that can be very frustrating or you think I have an initiation problem when, because I'm not answering when really I just haven't heard you, didn't even know anybody was talking to me. So we have to make sure all of that, what we have an understanding of what all of these abilities are like, how are they emotionally in this moment and what is the environment like? Thinking about recent changes, have there been any medications? I mentioned that some medications are, um, are at a therapeutic level within an hour. Others can take three weeks and some are ramped up. So you really need to have an understanding of what uh, what is the therapeutic level and how long does it take to get there? Because when we see a new behavior and it's three weeks after a new med and we say, well, it can't be that med because that was three weeks ago. It could be that med, it might be. So we need to really think about any changes and when we're, especially when we're we know somebody and there's, there is a change in behavior. Well, what's going on? What, what caused that was maybe, did they hit their head? Let's ask them about that. Maybe they fell out of bed. Um, anything else that changed, there could be a family situation that changed. Their brother just came and visited them and they have a, not a great relationship with their brother. And did the problem start or get worse when this thing happened or this change was made? And then with behavior, we need to think about what helps them to have appropriate behaviors. We don't wanna just intervene when something goes wrong. We wanna know, how can I help you to have good behavior? How can I help you to help yourself have good behavior? What sets them off? What are their triggers? And for both of these, what could help and what could hinder could be the, the same uh, list of things. So it could be that there it's the environment. We need to look at sometimes the environment will help, sometimes it's gonna hurt. What people are around them, uh, what, is there a certain way that we can speak with the person that will help them to calm down versus set them off, trigger them? And what helps to calm them when they're triggered? This is all information that we want to know and think about what is the person's behavior attempting to communicate and how can I help this person communicate it in a different way? Um, and depending on how able the person is to, is, is able to kind of, go through all of these questions with you, you can have them weigh in on some of this stuff. You know, just think memory, do you think memory is a problem? Now you have awareness issues that you have to take into mind as well, but um, we need to then come up with, with strategies and solutions. And we really, really, really want them to be a part of it so that when you cue, you say something, you do something and they say, you stop that. Why are you talking to me like that? You can say, oh, this, these were the words that you wanted me to say. Um, should we change them? Um, and I, for, for me, nine times out of 10, they back off and they say, oh, no, 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 that was fine. Because they're realizing you're not trying to embarrass them or, or anything like that. You're trying to, to do things that help them and what you're trying to do what they think will help them. So what, uh, what can I do? What internal strategies can work? 
Uh, so this, this is inside the person. They can repeat something. They can say, take a deep breath, saying it to themselves, um, take a deep breath. Uh, external strategies are things like calendars and timers and pictures, anything like that, that might help them um, both cognitively and behaviorally. So it might be like a behavior type of strategy, but it might be a cognition since the cognition is the thing underneath the surface. It's the big part of the iceberg creating the behavior. Um, we need to also be thinking about the environment. How can we change that? How, what kind of a role is, is that playing? And then, like I said, always have them. This is the child should always be included in developing the plan, but whoever it is that we're working with, we want them included uh, to the extent that that's possible. And then we, we're not gonna get it right the first time, every time. So we wanna see um, how did it work? How did what we tried work? And then we wanna modify them as needed. Sometimes they're just gonna take some time to work but um, other times we can modify them with the person's input. So that brainstorming solutions tool is up on our website as is the strategies and accommodations tool. I believe it's also in the service providers toolkit that I mentioned right at the very beginning. Um, so the strategies and accommodations tool, you go and you look for the strategies that might help with the issues that you find and there just gives a list of them and you can kind of dig through that and say, well, this, this, these aren't going to work, but I get what you're trying to go for here. You're trying to get me to do something, help the person do something differently and you can come up with something else uh, for that kind of brainstorming as well. Um, and there's a key of who you can go to for support. So maybe there's a speech language pathologist on the team and it's an area of cognition that they really should understand and will understand and you can go to them for help or the neuropsychologist, the OT, the PT. So all of that is there as well. And hopefully you have access to somebody to help you out. So we want to, in general, establish clear boundaries. What are the rules with a neutral tone? So we're just talking about it. One way to do that is to get ahead of things so that the rules are already known. We're not, it's not trying to, uh, to apply something when someone is already angry. It's just, oh, this is, this is just the way we do things. So examples are maybe there are house rules or the family rules that um, chores have to be done before the TV is turned on. Um, there's no loud noise after nine o'clock lights are out, we can go to the park after, and, and I, I specifically took off, I want to take off that word only. We don't want it to, that kind of sounds punitive. We're only gonna go to the park after three days of good behavior. We want it more to be positive. We get to go to the park after three days of good behavior. So we're gonna go for good behavior because we wanna get to that park. Um, here's, so it's a subtlety like that, like yeah, watching that language that we're, that we're, because that can really, someone will really hear that and um, that could set them off or make them feel like you're being condescending um, or you're trying to act like my mom. Uh, and then it could just be, here's, here's where the daily routine is. And so you can refer them to that. If you can refer someone to what the routine is for the day, sometimes that can stop them from going and doing that thing that they wanna do. And, uh, it's like, no, we have to do this first. This is, this is, it's Monday. This is what we do before we, we do um, those things that we want to do. And uh, you might do things like, here's a picture of how your room is supposed to look. So it's not so much me coming at you saying, you got to clean your room, but it's, hey, look, does it look like this? And it's this outside thing outside of me. Uh, so we need to anticipate behaviors, anticipate, um, review strategies. We might ask someone to walk away, avoid, <clears throat> excuse me, people, places, or situations that <clears throat> trigger inappropriate responses. You don't always want to do this, but sometimes it might make sense to let friends, families, and coworkers, roommates know about what the difficulty is so that they can then help or uh, if you understand, a lot of people are kind of afraid of people with disabilities because they don't know 
what to expect. They don't know what they can or can't do. So if we can educate people on some of that stuff with the person's um, blessing, then sometimes that can help. Or to if the person can say, <clears throat> I have difficulty sometimes um, with talking too much. If you could just kind of you know, put your finger up to your mouth a little bit or or you know, give me some sign that they both agreed on. When it's kind of time to stop, then um, that would really be helpful to me. Whatever, whatever the strategy and whatever you're working on. Other cases, you don't want to bring it up because you're kind of um, that person doesn't want people to know. So you have to talk with the person and figure that out. Um, reflect after there's been some behavior. There's been a verbal outburst. Burst. We have to reflect after that. We have to take responsibility. First, what caused it? What can we do next time to not have it happen? But then take responsibility and apologize. That's what we all have to do when we've not done the right thing is own up to it. And if that's kind of understood to be a piece of this whole thing too, that can be um, helpful in helping people to stop inappropriate behaviors. Um, I just love this guy, this puffer fish. You cannot, when you are deep breathing, I encourage you all to enjoy him and, and do it with him. When you are deep breathing, breathing in and breathing out with him, it is um, physiological, it's, it's hung up a sec, um, physiologically impossible to hold those same um, it just physiologically changes you, it calms you. So teaching people deep breathing strategies, I love the idea of using this puffer fish, this visual, because now I have a visual and some people are gonna hold on to that better than just some, some breathing exercise you were doing with me. Um, you can show them the picture of the puffer fish it, at times, or it can be posted around so that they think of it and you can also say, you know, remember the puffer fish once they've learned that. And so that that can be a cue to just calm down or take a deep breath. Uh, calm down, saying calm down to someone without giving them a way to calm down. I feel like it's not really fair. We need to give them a way. And deep breathing is a good way to do that. Uh, so let's give you a case now. Um, Joe, He so this is a, it's been modified, but... I am always astounded when I talk with you all and I hear the complexity of the cases that you deal with. And so this is a case that again has been changed, but that a group uh, brought to us that um, so that we could help them to understand the complexity of some of the behaviors that we see. So Joe wants everything clean. He tries to take a bath multiple times a day. He wants four towels. He has his days and nights mixed up. Sometimes he gets up with the night staff and tries to take a bath. But the last time he did that, he left the water on and there was a flood. He wants his sheets changed frequently. If staff won't change them, he uses the toilet, then goes back to the room and wipes himself on the sheets so that they have to be changed. And he has outbursts when he doesn't get what he wants. He's been violent with night staff. So they just give in to him and give him what he wants. So Question is, what would you do? So in the interest of time, uh, I'm gonna give you some thoughts on it, but you can go ahead and there's so many things that you could be thinking about, so many questions you could pose. Is it this? What about that? Have they tried this? So if you wanna put any of those in the chat, feel free and I'll just share some of the thoughts, uh, the first thoughts that I had about him. Uh, so he wants everything clean and he wants multiple baths a day. Is he, let's think about the cognition. Is he forgetting that he already took a bath? Is it as simple as setting up a visual schedule where he's cued to put his initials in there? So it's not someone else checking it off. It's his initials, uh, it's his mark. And he knows that he's already taken it. We, we can just direct him back to there. Oh no, Joe, you, you did this already today. Uh, he seems to be trying to get away thing with things with night staff. And we hear this a lot where it's, Good with this person, bad with that person, good in the day, bad at night. Now it could be a personnel is issue, something that the person's doing, could be time of day, lots of questions. So why is this? Um, are they doing something or communicating something in a different way than the day staff? Is there something that we can learn from day staff? What do they do? And what if day 
day and night. So if there's maybe a better relationship with day staff, is there a, an opportunity for us to sit down together, both shifts, and come up with a plan with Joe that he then sticks to? And maybe we refer him back to day staff for that reinforcement that has to happen. Or reinforcement sets them up for success before they leave. They're like, okay, um, you're just, just taking one bath. Or we just took the bath, don't need to take it tonight. Um, again, setting people up for success and preparing them for what's to come is really, really helpful. Um, is it okay that he uses four towels? Maybe it is. And it's just maybe our thing that we don't want him to because it doesn't seem right. Well, if it's okay, can we just let him? Maybe there's something calming about that 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 helps him. Um, can we let it go? If we can't let it go, then can we come up with something where um, we help him to understand away from bath time and come up with an agreement and help him understand why it's not okay? Maybe he can be responsible for washing his own towels so that staff isn't overly burdened by having all having to do it more frequently. Um, with his days and nights mixed up, maybe we can set up a nighttime routine that's going to support sleep. No screens or video games after a certain time. Maybe he stays in his room at night so he can't disturb other people. Uh, get an agreement, uh, his agreement on the need to fix the schedule that, you know, he might think it's perfectly fine. He loves being up at night. He doesn't have to deal with people and he loves that. Um, can melatonin or something be used with the, can we ask the doctor about something like that to help the sleep cycle with the sheets? Uh, it could be the same thing as with the bath that if we create a schedule and this is how often we're going to change the sheets and they need to be left on until, uh, until a week, you know, for a week they need to, and it's his initials. Again, can he be responsible for washing them and making the bed? So if he soils them, he has to be responsible or there's some consequence for maybe he can't physically do it, but there's some consequence for uh, soiling the sheets on, on purpose. Um, he earns his fun tasks by not soiling the sheets and by leaving them on the bed for the, um, the agreed upon amount of time and uh, getting violent with the night staff. We, again, we really need to look at what the night staff is doing differently if they are. And, uh, Again, we might find that once we get them on a regular sleep white late wake cycle, that might do away with things. It might be that threshold kind of thing where he just loses it more quickly when he's fatigued. Um, so maybe the maybe the violence will just go away when we can get him on a better schedule. So so complex. I only touched on some things. If you are all are adding things to the chat, then um, you're you've seen that there's even more things that can be at play here that we can try. So lots of things. Um, and we need to all be on the same page to do that, everybody that's working with him. And I, I just love this idea of uh, both of the ideas that are here that staff can often see or a family member can often see that it's going to be a bad day. We may have somebody in our life where, uh, you know, your husband uh, wakes up or comes into the room. And you're like, oh, OK, I see where we are right now. So what does that what does the staff see? What is it? specifically what are the signs how and then getting the connection with how is that person feeling on those days so um you look like you are i see um your face looks tighter than normal which might be like you're angry how are you feeling right now uh, and what can we do differently on this day and what can we get the person to do differently on this day? Or and and we can help them to increase their awareness of how they're feeling in any on any day or in any given moment. Again, by a visual. Visuals can be very very helpful. So we want to be asking them, even when we think they're a one. Well, where are you? And we might be going into a new task. Well, where are you? I'm a one. I'm a two. Okay. There's where we want to intervene. We don't want to wait until the three. Um, we want to get them to increase their self-awareness of where they are at any given moment and then know what to do when they realize where they are. Um, so again, it's the two that we want to intervene at. We don't want to have things too late. I'm gone. Uh, so we need to be developing trust. I'm going to be talking about, about more about that in a moment. We need to understand their behavior, what's happening, what's happening outside and what's happening inside. 
and recognize the things that we see that are happening and respond to those before something escalates. So they start pacing. That's one of their things. We need to, to know that. They start picking, they start rocking, uh, they, their attention starts to get bad. We need to know these things about this person, be looking for them um, and raise your awareness of them. So we're not just looking at the behavior, we're looking at what happens before the behavior. And we also need to be looking at the consequence, which might be supporting the behavior. So if, if you're letting Joe, um, let's see, in his case, it might be um, letting him soil the sheets so he doesn't become violent. Um, he's gonna keep on soiling the sheets. That's probably not, that's not a good example. Um, but you get my point that if we if if the be the consequence of the, the natural consequence of that is like let's say he then doesn't have to he gets put a, put away to spend time in his room quietly he might like that he might want that so we have to really be careful about what is the consequence and is it supporting the behavior just increasing it uh, we want to be positive whenever we can in in, in positive and proactive. When we're working with other people who's working with this person, we have to watch the development of our reputation. We have to really, really look at what we are saying. We can get very frustrated by things and we can just go, you know, this guy's trouble. He was just so annoying today, right? Really normal sort of human response. But these are probably our, our folks that at first, we really don't want to be doing that with anybody. We want to be much more objective about things. Um, we want to be saying something more like he had a hard time keeping his hands to himself today. And it seemed to help if he has a stress ball. Or maybe I have no idea. What, nothing helped him that day. I can say that he had a hard time keeping his hands to himself. I tried a number of things. I tried this and this and this. Um, nothing worked. So you might try those, but you might you might try something else today, or maybe we can talk about this at some point because what we were doing isn't working anymore. So we're keeping it very objective, very professional. Um, we're also keeping it in a way that, let's say we're a family member, so we're not trying to be professional per se, but um, it's a way that I can move forward with this person because I'm not angry now. I'm really looking at it, okay, what's really happening here and what am I gonna, how are we gonna fix it? much more proactive. So now we're gonna move into de-escalation techniques. So this is, things went bad. Things got too big. They got to that three that I mentioned a few minutes ago. And uh, what are we gonna do now? And the first rule, so the early bird gets the worm, that's what that picture is about. Um, we intervene early because we never wanna get to escalation. We never wanna get there if we can. Not always possible, we know that. but. We need to intervene early because the best way to de-escalate is never escalate in the first place. I hope that makes sense because that's really key. Um, the next set of slides here are gonna have this purple band on the bottom. They come from a great, great article. I'd highly recommend it to you, but we're gonna go through it. Uh, by Owen Price in the International Journal of Mental Health Nursing. So they went into a mental health facility where there were assaults and they looked at what was happening before those assaults, after those assaults, they were looking at, they were trying to reduce them or trying to understand them better. And one of the most important things that they found was that from their perspective, it was the staff patient interaction. So it might be not patient, might be family member, might be person served, different wording, but it was that interaction with us that was found to be a major thing that happened before the assault. So we've got to look at what we're doing. So there were seven themes to what made effective, uh, different themes. And one of them was the characteristics of effective de-escalators. Who was good at de-escalating? And I have a picture of Mark Harmon here because I want you to think about from NCIS, I want you to think about any movie that you've ever seen with a hostage negotiator, they are open. They are being as honest as they are aware uh, as they can. They are very self-aware. They're aware of the whole situation of what's going on with themselves and what's going on with the person. They express genuine concern. They appear non-threatening. They have a permissive, 
non-authoritative, you know, I'd love to let you do that. Can't do that. So I, I put my limit up, but I, I'm trying, you know, trying to be as permissive as possible. You saw that uh, a theme was maintaining personal control. This is hard for a lot of us. We need to appear calm no matter what is happening. And so you don't have to be calm. He's not saying be calm. He's saying you have to appear calm. The other person has to see you as calm. Remaining calm in the midst of chaos is a superpower. The third theme was our verbal and nonverbal skills. We want to have a calm, gentle, soft tone. Again, think of those hostage negotiators. Um, everything is going crazy around them, but they are, you know, they're on the phone with the guy in the bank, which is not going to be our situation, but they're calm. Uh, they're using tactful language. They're thinking about their words. They're aware of their body language. What is it conveying? There was active listening. You're you're not just thinking about what you want to say. You're really hearing the person. There's some eye contact. In general, you don't want to have too much because that can be a threat. Don't invert, invade someone's personal space. You want to keep that so they're not, again, not feeling threatened. Uh, the, the fourth theme was engaging with that that person served. So a hostage negotiator has to establish a bond really quickly, however they can. For us that are working with people on a daily basis, and we know these people, that should be a primary job. Even though I did not deal with a lot of behaviors in my job, I did, but not a lot of not a lot of violence or anything like that. Um, in order for me to be effective as a speech pathologist, I had to have a bond with that person. They had to trust me. They had to know I cared about them. That what they thought about what we were doing was important. Um, so you've got to get that bond, which means showing up, um, talking to them in an appropriate way every time without being condescending. We need to focus on promoting their autonomy where possible, minimize restriction. And then the effective people knew when to intervene and that was early. Again, we bring our early bird with the worm back. Um, early intervention is vital. Again, I just cannot stress to you enough. You do not, anybody who has been in a situation where things have gotten escalated, you would have given anything to have been able to stop it beforehand or go back and change that one thing because it's much harder to bring it down. Um, they ensure safe conditions. So this is understanding in general what level of staff presence is necessary. So if the person's calm, we only need one person. But if the person's not calm, we need at least two. And that's not, I'm just making that up. You, your numbers could be different, but let's say there's we need one to deal with the person, but then we need to one to deal with everyone else because maybe there's a group of people. Uh, we need to be aware of where our exits are always, so you can always get out, uh, and then know what things could be used as weapons. Just be very aware of that. Maybe we need to get rid of some things beforehand. Uh, just in general, keeping the environment more safe. We need to encourage the person to move to a safe, quiet area when they're escalated, moving them away from others or moving, sometimes getting them away from people as they're on their way up can bring them back down because now we've we've eliminated a lot of distraction and maybe some of their triggers. So uh, the other thing, the theme was strategies. What strategies do people use? And this is, I, I, I'm smiling as I'm saying this, as I'm gonna say this, because um, it, it's helpful and it's not helpful. But this was the bottom line was deciding on, on a strategy is an intuitive, instinctive process requiring flexibility, creativity, is based on individual needs and characteristics of the patient. So yeah, in some cases we can have some general rules but then we also have to be able to flex to the moment. We need to um, listen, use empathy, and be able to interpret the nonverbal cues that we're seeing. Like I said, understanding they're starting to pace now. Um, understand those, those nonverbal cues. Uh, we need to balance our support of the person with control of the situation. And interve interventions need to be proportionate to the risk posed. So for example, you're not, we're not going to do this anyway, but we're not going to lunge and tackle somebody. 
when they're not doing anything that's going to, they're just angry. They're not going to harm anybody or, or themselves, um, especially at this point. So we need to weigh that intervention. We're going to, um, what's the risk posed? Uh, in terms of those strategies, four types were things that confirmed the person's autonomy, their, their ability to freely do things that I can um, let you do this, but I can't let you do that. There, you can go ahead, you could go ahead, you can walk around, you can do that, you can pace over here, that's perfectly fine. You can yell in this room. If you need to do that, go ahead. Um, ways to facilitate expression. So keep in mind that behavior is often, it's communicating something. So the person is having a hard time communicating verbally what it is that they wanna say. So how can we help them? How can we um, maybe offer some suggestions? Um, gotta be careful with that. You know, otherwise you can set, set someone off by, that. no, I am not, whatever. Um, but help, how can we help them to facilitate what it is that they wanna say? Um, offer alternatives to ag aggression. Listen, I cannot let you punch him. I know you wanna punch him. I cannot let you punch him. What I can do is let you scream into this pillow. I can let you pound this play. I can let you punch the pump in, punching bag. And hopefully we've got some of these things ready for the person that, or for people in general, what can help. I can let you do these things. I can't let you do that. Um, having limits and, um, and watching the authoritative interventions, but still having them like, this is our line. We can't, we can't allow that. So again, his summary is um, that it's the process of, of de-escalation is about establishing rapport. We've got to have that. You want that um, to gain the person's trust, minimize restriction to protect their self-esteem. Um, they need to, to save face in this situation, appear externally calm and self-aware in the face of aggressive behavior, and intuitively identify creative and flexible interventions that will reduce the need for uh, aggression. So again, there's not a rigid set of rules that we can follow to make this situation better. It has to be a little more fluid than that. So I want to give you a case, uh, a situation that I was in. Again, names and specifics are changed. Uh, however, um, I was in the situation where there was a fire alarm at, where, at the brain trauma unit that I worked at and it was outpatient. So everybody was mobile. Everybody came outside, different parts of the building went to different places, lots of people. And the all clear bell is rung and everybody starts to go inside. And I, it's kind of like the C's part and I see John and Lisa in front of me and they are face to face. And you know how like, just things stick out in situations like this. The other thing that I become, that I, was hyper aware of is their counselor is walking in the building. He's, and it's it's far enough away from us at this point, I cannot yell. Um, and so those things stick out to me. I see them there. I know them both very well. I know their communication is not good. And they're having, a, they're in some sort of disagreement and I know that John is paranoid and I know that Lisa has a very tough exterior, but she's a pussycat inside, but she, she comes up, this is in the Northeast and, and she's really tough and they are face to face. And I see John reach in his pocket and pull out a knife and he holds it down at his side. Uh, I realize this is trouble. Um, I feel 99% uh, sure he will harm her. And if I, so I, my choices in front of me are to go inside and try to get help. And I'm sure he will harm her in that time because uh, I'm watching the way this is escalating. I'm also 99% sure he will not harm me. We have a very good relationship. I knew about the paranoia. I had worked with, uh, you know, kind of around it being really calm um, and patient around him and supportive. And um, so I walk over and stand next to Lisa and say, John, look at me, John, it's Wendy. Look at me, John, look at me, John, look at me. I want to kind of break it 
and, and de-escalate it, calm him down and get his focus away from her. Because anytime he looks at her, he just, he, his, his voice raises, um, his face changes. He'd look at me and that would calm. So I'm trying to go, John, look at me, look at me. It's Wendy. Look at me. At the same time, I'm kind of pulling my arm up and, um, putting it against, um, Lisa's, uh, waist and, and just starting to kind of slowly try to push her back a little bit because she does not understand this situation. She doesn't know that she's in trouble. She hasn't seen the knife. Uh, they're, they're going face to face and, um, I'm, I'm going, John, look at me, Lisa, walk away. John, look at me, Lisa, walk away. Um, eventually I get him to focus more and more on me and I get her to move back and I eventually get her to be able to go into the building and he and I just stay for a moment, a few moments, and we calm down even further. Um, I get him to put the knife away and we walk into the building. And I know the first person that we're going to encounter is not the person that we need. So I don't let him go into the office. I get that person to call and, and get the counselor that we do need, get him to come up. Um, he came up, they chatted, he fully got him de-escalated and I went into the back and collapsed because I had my calm exterior. But um, this was a case where I did some of the things, it had to be fluid where um, I needed that eye contact. I, even though it can be threatening, my eye contact with him was not threatening. And then once I got him to be able to, then I, I went back into not fully, not always looking at him, you know, kind of look away to talk. Um, once she was out of the way and out of harm's way, um, I also initially stood way too close because I, I matched where she was and then got her to back up. And as I could get her to back up, I could back up. So it's all fluid. Um, I've had many years to think about this. And I, I, I don't think I would do anything differently. I feel like it would have had not a very good result at all. Uh, so let's, I have three slides just on trauma behavior and I wanna leave time for questions for you. So if tr someone has a history of trauma, that impacts how they behave. So some signs of that are hyperactivity, aggression, anxiety, depression. They can be unpredictable. Their self-regulation is not good and small things can set off a large reaction. This thing, so this comes from the ASHA leader. You'll see we're at a, a green high, a border banner down at the bottom. This one was surprising to me that Enthusiastic praise can also set them off. So again, think of that threshold and anything too big can set it off. So a lot of us who work with, with folks will tend to be enthusiastic saying, that was great, that was awesome, great job. We can't do that. We have to kind of go, wow, that was really, that was good, that was good. Not too enthusiastic, not watch our tone. Uh, once upset, they can be difficult to calm, to instruct, to reassure. They have a hard time connecting with people. They're on guard and they don't trust people well. And their language developmentally is often, language comprehension especially, is often reduced. So some things don't show those strong emotions, even if they're positive, stay calm. Don't take it personally. Just when we were, when we were talking about any of these behaviors, don't take it personally, especially with trauma related. They may be testing you to see if you're gonna stay around. No one stays around. So I'm going to, you're not going to stay around. So let's push you and see if, if you'll go too. Let's just get this over with. Slowly develop connections. It can take longer. And we need to do even just little things like just, just keep showing up, be calm, be genuinely interested. And then um, ask ourselves is what we're seeing. Can this be based in trauma? Could it be an uncontrolled panic response right now? Uh, set firm but flexible boundaries and coming back to establish clear boundaries with folks with a neutral tone um, and change your view of success. So the fact that the person showed up for group again is outstanding. They may not be able to stay for more than five minutes, but they showed up again. Change your view of success. Take the little hits um, so that over time, take the little successes. So over time, we can build on them rather than coming down, you know, uh, you only stayed for five minutes, that's not good enough. And then this does not come from the actual leader. Um, it came from a friend of mine, a psychologist who said, 
um, find something, anything that you can like about that person and put your focus there. When you go, even before you show up at work, you know, you're going to have this person on your schedule. Think about the thing that you like about them. And it can be little. It will help you so much if you can do that. Because now you're focused on kind of related to the reputation, a lot of different things that we've talked about here today. Um, it's going to get you a different focus so you can go in with a positive attitude. Teamwork, this is not just trauma, this is everything. Wherever you can work with a team, please, please do it. Make that team work better. Make them work at a as a team if they're if they if you don't have regular meetings, but you can, or you can set up a communication notebook between all of you. Make that happen. Uh, if there's an expert, pull them in. What do they recommend doing in this situation? Uh, communication is key amongst the team, and consistency is is key. Having everybody rowing in the same direction, if you will, in the sense that um, there are some disorders like uh, borderline personality disorder, where they were they will attempt to split the team. And so I would hear every once in a while when we had someone who was borderline, I would hear, well, um, well, she said that I can do this. And I'm thinking, that does not fit at all. The first time I ever encountered this, didn't know this was a thing. You, you, meet, you see so many different things um, that you're not the primary expert in. And, and I'm listening going, this just this doesn't make sense. Um, so the first thing I did was take it back to the team and back to that person. And the psychologist there could help us to understand that this is what this, is what this person is going to do. They're going to attempt to split. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to be consistent and we're going to follow this approach. So teamwork. Uh, some tools I've talked with you about our website, tndisability.org slash brain. Uh, some of the tools that I talked about are there, including also a personal guide to everyday living with a brain injury, which can help people especially understand their attention because attention is such a big issue with uh, a lot of people. Uh, help them to understand that and you can help head off some other problems. You can take a look at that. Um, I do want to make a video for our webs, our YouTube channel on specifically that. So stay tuned. Uh, our YouTube training channel, look at those playlists, see which one fits you the best and just play around. Brainline has great information on behavior and anger specifically. Some other resources are Tennessee's service coordinators. Uh, they can help. You do not want to refer everybody with a brain injury to them. You will overwhelm them. Reserve it for the people that you really need some help with, and they can help you to figure out referral sources and, and uh, think through some things, and they are free. They also run virtual support groups, which have been very successful, very, um, very well attended, where in-person just doesn't work for people with brain injury and their families. And there's a, a Tennessee Family Support Program, which does offer some funds. You have to have specific criteria that you have to meet. So I'll let you look at that. Um, and the toolkits, I mentioned both of those, the Survivors, Families, and Caregivers Toolkit. So you can just give them the link to the whole toolkit, or you can pull out what they might need at that time. And we also have one specifically developed for you with different uh, topics that might be relevant to you all with resources there. So I would highly recommend you download the Service Professionals Toolkit. I'm going to leave you with a couple of closing thoughts. Uh, I went to a training on, uh, it was on children, and the person said, the child is not trying to be your problem today. They are having a problem today. I thought that was so powerful. So I wanted to share it with you that maybe they're just having a problem today. They're not trying to cause a problem for you. Remember that it's the brain. It's not the person's not necessarily trying to do this to you. It's the brain. Something is lit up. Something is not lit up enough. It's not communicating well between areas. It's the brain creating this. Um, and just a reminder that brain injuries are reasons. They're not excuses. And this is coming from someone who advocates for people with brain injuries all the time. We still need to have rules, boundaries, requirements, expectations, accommodations, their need for that is even greater because the structure is not coming from within them. I hope that makes sense. So we're not, we're not here to say, oh, it's the brain. 
you know, don't worry about it. It's the brain. Their brain's not doing it. No, we're, we're attempting to change that um, by giving them rules, boundaries, requirements, expectations, accommodations, putting that structure in place, helping them to understand it and work, work with that. Any questions? I'm gonna switch as you kind of formulate your questions. Um, you might wanna put it in the chat. And Jenna's taking a look at that. And while we're waiting for any questions, uh, you can go to this QR code and take a literally a one minute survey and you can get a, a certificate of attendance. It'll come to your email so that you can get some uh, credit for this if you can apply it uh, to your certification or your license. But I thank you all, I'm waiting for any questions. I thank you all for being here and you can find me, you can, any question that we can't answer here today, you can get me at wendy underscore e at tndisability.org. Jen, are you seeing any questions? Hey, Wendy. Um, I have one. Um, Rebecca said, my husband's 52, and how can I help him out with this? Um, it would depend on what the behavior is, I would say, and then what his, so I would welcome you to, um, to email me if you'd like, or to call me. Um, I'll it, put it your would, email in the chat. Okay, thanks. Um, it would really depend. I can't really answer without knowing what is the problem that you're encountering or the challenge and what are his strengths, what are his weaknesses, both in terms of cognition and communication. Oh, I'm going to put this, I'm, I'll put this survey link in the chat here as well, just for to make that a little easier if anybody's having trouble with the QR code. Thank you for that message. Any other questions? Again, you can, this PowerPoint is already up. The video will be up soon. And the um, the PowerPoint and video for the cognition training from January are up on the website already under the training. No questions. Well, we've got, a, we've got some coming in. Okay. Um, and one, thing to maybe add, um, we you talked about it throughout the PowerPoint, but um, in the webinar, but um, the toolkits that we've put the links on here for, there is one toolkit specifically for survivors, family members, and caregivers. And even if you um, just bookmark that, that's going to contain a lot of the resources that we shared today. And if you're a professional on today's webinar, the one um, for service professionals is going to have a lot of these um, individual items that Wendy's covered all in one place for you on our toolkits link. Um, so Wendy, another question we have is, do you often see TBI within early childhood? Within early childhood, absolutely. Unfortunately, yes. Uh, and even um, you'll see in some of our trainings that even if it's a concussion, so a mild traumatic brain injury, we see challenges the, the research is now coming out that there are, that child can have challenges uh, for the rest of their life if we don't have early intervention and then continued monitoring and stepping in every time we need to to get that child support uh, people are we're just thinking that oh it's just a concussion it's no big deal and we're seeing that it can be a very very big deal for a developing brain and if you have a specific, like a specific question about someone that you're thinking of, um, please reach out to me. And Rachel, I think it was Rachel. I do want to answer your question. I do want to help you. So if you want to contact me, please, please do. I, I hate to leave you hanging with, I don't know what to tell you because I need more information. And we do have um, another question. When an individual has a mental health diagnosis and a brain injury, where both cognition and recognition of symptoms are impaired, do you have any advice on which to manage or work with first? The mental health or the um, or the awareness of symptoms. Um, I I would try to work on both together. Um, 
the I can tell you what I can tell you about awareness of symptoms. So it depend again, it would depend on what is the mental health issue and how big is it. Uh, because mm -hmm. if we like with the bipolar that I was talking about earlier, we deal with that and we may take away our our challenge, the person's challenge. Um, I, what I can tell you about awareness of symptoms is that I often in, in our cognitive rehab department, I often had to work on awareness before you could work on anything else. No one's gonna change anything if they're not aware that it's a problem. And if depression is the mental health issue, then you have to be really careful with that. You have to do it in a way like, let's say there's a memory problem and I need you to, in order for you to use a strategy, I need you to know that there's a, that there's a memory problem there, but you're depressed, um, then I, I need to do that in a way that lets you know that there is help. Um, I see that you have you had problems with your memory there. What do you think if we wrote that wrote that information down, or what if we highlighted that information? Or I noticed that when you uh, when you started highlighting, it changed everything. It really got better. I do remember one woman who was so distraught. Uh, understandably so. She was in a car accident and her family was killed in the car accident and she was severely impaired and her depression was so intense. Um, we, um, so I was so fortunate to work on a team. So we were able to work on both at the same time. For most people, it became clear that she could not engage with the rest of us until the depression had had lightened a bit. Normally we would work at the same time, but for this one case, it was so extreme. She would just come into all of our sessions and just cry. So we needed to uh, put co uh, cognitive th rehab on hold until mental health was better. And then she came back and she did great, did great and has a beautiful life. Um, so it, the answer is still is depends. Um, well, I, we've gotten tons of comments about thank you and it's great information. And someone said they're, um, they have a case coming up with the youth that has TBI and this information has been so helpful. So lots of very kind comments and lots of compliments. Um, someone asked, is there a video or training on de-escalation tips for families or caregivers that can be shared at a support group meeting? And I can answer this one part of it while you think about that. Go ahead. Right. Um, would this be in the toolkits? No, we don't have any, um, we don't have any videos there and examples of de-escalation tip tips. I'd have to, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Our toolkits, um, are PDF and you can download the whole toolkit or you can download sections of the toolkit, or you can just bookmark it and go to the website and look at it as you need. Um, but I'm trying to think if we have a different de-escalation uh, training on our YouTube channel. I think we don't. I, I think my approach to that, I think that would be awesome if that's there. But I also feel like it's so complex that I think if I had an ongoing support group, what I might try would be to take some of these um, these key ideas and work on one or two of, teach one or two of them each time. So teaching the concept that uh, separating the person from the behavior, the things that are caregiving is so hard, so hard. So teaching them the things that are going to enable them to be able to continue. Find the thing that you like, teach that um, it's the brain, uh, separate the person from the behavior. Those I might teach in one, give them something to kind of just keep on going, showing up again. And then I might um, teach things about um, our our relationship and what we say is so important and can escalate and we can get sad and angry and fed up. And so we react in that way. So I'd help people to understand that, that the way we communicate, building that bond, all of that, that might be another way of doing another, another session. I might talk about another time ways of giving feedback um, we could say this or we could say that, uh, which is better, which would you rather hear? Um, somebody poses a situation, okay, let's brainstorm it and say what what might work. Um, in what might we say in that situation? 
Um, so I think I might go about it that way. And I think that would give you a lot of great content to um, to talk about across time. But I, I, there's nothing that I'm aware of, but uh, we'll we'll take a look at that. And if we do, we'll, um, we will include it somewhere if we can, uh, either on the website. Great question. Yeah. Um, we've got two more and we still have five minutes and we still have a lot of our people on here with us. So mm -hmm. just a reminder for everybody, um, if you haven't yet, take a moment to go either to the QR code or to the link to complete your survey and you'll get your certificate of attendance. We're also going to send you that follow up email. It'll probably come early next week from Zoom that will have the link to the recording and you can share that and it'll have the resources from today. Um, we have a question, Wendy, can a student's head banging create a TBI over time? And what's your advice? Absolutely. And it can be from one time um, and over time for sure. So my advice would be that that, that is probably um, someone who has autism, doesn't have to be, but, uh, uh, so I might get in touch with people who are autism behavior specialists and get their input first. Um, uh, the that that's probably where I would go first, be, especially since they also have a whole lot of um, experience with specifically that. You need to protect the brain, uh, or we're going to see a, a, an escalation in things over time or a deterioration in things over time. Um, so we've got to protect the brain however we can and try to figure out what is, what's the precursor to that, what makes that happen. And, uh, and if you need some a behavior specialist involved, uh, absolutely hmm. get one involved. You made me think of something too, to add to this, Wendy, the, um, our symptom tracker, um, if you're not already using something like that is a good way to keep up with what's the trigger when it happens, what you do, what helps or doesn't help. And I'll I'll try to find that and get a link in our chat real quick. And our mm -hmm. last question, Wendy, um, mm -hmm. so far is in rural East Tennessee, we have a great many cases and little in the way of resources. Many of our clients are homeless. What are first steps? Wow. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is come to our um, we run a program called uh, Tennessee Brighter Futures. It's a collaborative that looks at all of these overlapping, um, all of these overlapping comorbidities or, or coexisting issues like homelessness and traumatic brain injury, brain injury and chronic pain and opioid use. And so each group, uh, each system of support talks each time uh, we've been doing this for just over a year now. Uh, we've had talks on mental health, substance abuse, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, brain injury, domestic violence, and juvenile justice. In March, criminal justice is going to be speaking, and in May, uh, homelessness will be talking. So they'll be helping us to understand their folks better and what we all need to know uh, to do. So I would come there because a lot of resources will come out of that. Um, that's rough, it's in the homeless community. So I think I would go to the homeless kind of, that's where that, that's where that Tennessee Brighter Futures is, is a great place to come because you, I feel like you kind of need our input from TBI and you need their input from homelessness and, um, we do know a lot of resources in East for homelessness. You may already be, you may be one of those resources. So I can't direct you to those, or if you need them, we can direct you. Um, it's really hard. What we, what we then teach people to do is um, not to send people somewhere, but to, to, uh, to figure out what's happening, especially cognitively, and then accommodate for those issues. So everybody in a mental health facility doesn't need to come to us but the people in the mental health facility need to be trained to um, spot when there's a, t a TBI. So do do prior history of TBI. So I would do that. And we know in the homeless po this popul population, it's between 50 to 80% have had a prior TBI. 
and just being on the street will increase their chances of having one. So uh, it's a huge, huge number. Um, so yeah, really complicated, uh, but but go back to that training in January. So you can you can spot the cognitive things that are happening and then apply strategies. And then that will help the person to be hopefully more successful in being able to follow through on a plan or whatever, what it is that they need to do. And if you need to reach out to me for more with more specifics, please do. It's 11.30 now. Jen. Um, I think that's going to be all of our questions. Just lots of compliments and thank yous. Thank you all for such great questions and input today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. And if, if I didn't adequately answer your question, please reach out to me and I'll help you further. Um, sometimes it gets a little bit complicated, but I thank you so much. We all thank you from BrainLinks for being here today. And please join us at Tennessee Brighter Futures. And, um, and thanks so much.